Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for attending the first of my webinars for 2022. I had thought very carefully about this topic, that the first topic that I was going to select for these webinars. I And la late last year, I think it was in November, I had written a blog about anosmia, COVID-related, um, and COVID-related anosmia. And I had a one of my friend's niece, young, quite young, still a teenager, had lost, she had recovered from all the symptoms of COVID, but had a, one of the lingering side effects was anosmia. I felt it was very important to do some work and investigation to see how we could help her. Um, I then realized that anosmia was very, very common um, in relation to COVID. I have been in preparing for this seminar. I've tried, I have attempted to use the most up-to-date papers and research. And when I say up-to-date, I am talking about 2022, late 2029, because it would appear that certainly what we now know uh, about anosmia may not, I hope and pray that it does not relate as significantly to the Omicron variant. So let's have a look at what I've put together and that I'd like to share with you. Now, I have no doubt many of you that are watching have probably experienced this. I know from some of the Facebook feeds and comments that I've been getting that that is the case. Please I no notice that there's a lot of chats because these are short events. I want to keep them within that 45 minute range. I won't be, um, we, I've, got, I've got an assistant to help me with the chats, but uh, please share the important thing and the way that we can come up with better treatments, better strategies to, and a better understanding of anosmia is by sharing our experiences and sharing what has worked and what hasn't worked. Um, all I can say from everything that I've read, please be patient. In some cases, it may take just several months. It, um, most people bounce back quickly, but in other cases, it seems to end up being quite prolonged. So some of the strategies that we'll be talking about, they seem to be quite, pr they're proven and they seem to be successful, but they don't seem to work as quickly as we would hope in some cases. So I've put together a lot of information. Now, I won't be sharing the video, the PowerPoint presentation. Don't get upset. I am sharing, however, all the content that is in the PowerPoint presentation is going to be available in a blog and you'll be sent the link to the blog. There was also, there's a couple of other little interesting articles and clips that I found. Please uh, take the time to, to read them. And more importantly, any comments that you would like to make, please share them on, the, on my Facebook and then we can collate it, summarize it, and I'll be able to respond to you. So let's um, move on. Now, I did want to talk, first of all, about some of the other um, webinars that I will be doing throughout the year. Now, we've only got the dates for the next one, All Will Be Well, The Wisdom of Julian Norwich and Aromatherapy, a very interesting one. Um, you'll be hearing more about this very soon. I suppose very much Julian Norwich lived in a period in England at the time of the bubonic plague. And she took solace um, during this time. Um, she had many revelations and these revelations were written in a book, which we can still read today. And, and within these revelations, there is so much beautiful wisdom. And it's very important because I think it relays back to uh, a spiritual context into which how we maybe we approach illness, how we approach um, does, how we approach all these challenges that we come across in our life. And I then relate it to some of the key factors such as 
expression of gratitude, compassion, and resilience, and how essential oils can help to nourish these um, elements. We'll also be, I'll be doing a webinar on sustainably sourcing essential oils. I will be updating you on some of the latest work and research that I've been doing regarding essential oils and the practice of forest bathing, Shinrin Yoku. We'll look at incense there. I, um, some of you are familiar with the fact that I have uh, a lot of work in Japan, so I will be looking at some very gorgeous Japanese essential oils later on in the year. There will be quite a diverse range of topics, as you can see, aromatherapy and the zodiac signs, aromatherapy, gratitude and well-being. And of course, one of my favorite little um, webinars and events has always been blending, and it's the more creative aspect of blending essential oils. Now let's have a look at what we are going to talk about tonight. In this webinar, what I want to look at is first of all, let's look at some statistics about COVID related anosmia and what anosmia actually is and so, and so on. I then want to briefly touch on the pathophysiology of COVID related smell loss. And there are several, um, um, I think there are multiple pathways involved. Um, and it's just been interesting from reading some of the earlier work to some of the most recent work, um, how much the knowledge of what we know about COVID related smell loss has really changed. Um, before it was purely thought of as being an inflammatory condition within the nasal epithelium, within the, within the um, nasal epithelium, but now we understand so much more. We will then briefly, and I'm no doubt that those of you who have experienced or are experiencing some form of smell loss will understand the impact and what it means to have lost your sense of smell or to have an altered sense of smell and what impact that has on our health and well-being. So we'll also touch upon that. And this is where I'd like you to please share with others your experience and how you and, and strategies that you have found work um, for you while your sense of smell slowly recovers. We will also discuss because most out of everything that has been proposed, the most commonly spoken about strategy has been smell training. So we'll actually look at what smell training is. And then we'll have a look at, well, which essential oils should I be using for smell training? And I will also, will touch briefly on some of the other therapies that may be also beneficial to help deal with smell loss. Now, it's very interesting because in the early days, of COVID, smell loss was um, used as one of the primary diagnostic criteria um, that you had COVID. That you had COVID. However, that seems to now have changed with the Omicron variant. Now, with the Omicron variant, some of the key symptoms include runny nose, includes headaches, fatigue, sneezing, snore throat, and coughing. With the Delta variant and with earlier variants of COVID, smell loss, smell loss was ranked number six. However, sorry, I'm going to flick back here, was ranked number six. But now it's ranked down much lower. I think it's now ranked about the 17th. Now it's very interesting. Yep, this report here says that, and this is based on the UK. So various, various countries um, have, researchers in those countries have published a paper. So I've relied on this information. Couldn't find too much coming out of Australia, but it was incredible the amount of work coming from overseas, especially from the UK and from USA, where a lot of research has been done. But in the UK, smell loss, Loss of smell or loss of taste as well in the Omicron cases was only 13%. Now, this actually, while it's lower than 
those infected with um, the Delta variant where it was about 34%. The problem here is that far more people are getting Omicron. So I hope 13% sounds low, but it could actually be quite high. So that is a little bit of a concern there. Now, According to the, um, uh, the Zoe list, and this is out of the UK, a database and an app that's been developed to, to identify symptoms of COVID, um, loss of smell now ranks about 17th. So that means that it's relatively rare compared to loss of smell being ranked as sixth most common symptom when the Delta variant was most dominant. Now, I saw a, um, a somebody post on Facebook that she had experienced COVID back in 2020 and smell loss. She still is suffering from some form of parasomnia, which we'll talk about, which is partial. So her smell, her sense of smell has not fully recovered and that's two years on. So, um, while COVID smell loss now is much lower as a symptom and it's not likely to um, occur with the Omicron variant, we, um, there are still a lot of people who have are experiencing or some form of olfactory dysfunction. Now, the, perhaps the correct term to use is an olfactory dysfunction because anosmia would actually refer to a complete loss of smell. And I will look at some of the def, so I will look at, uh, I'll, I'll give you some definitions um, in this presentation of the various terms that are used for some of these olfactory um, dysfunctions. But one, as many as 1.6 million individuals in the US alone have experienced some form of chronic olfactory dysfunction because of COVID. Now that is quite high and it's probably more because some of it may not be going, not be reported. Now, I was actually surprised and these figures, I did find different percentages depending where I looked. I went with this one, this seemed quite high, but I'm probably not surprisingly that, you know, it's probably correct. I was surprised to learn that even before the COVID pandemic, up to 19.1% of all adults and 80% of people over the age of 75 have, su have suffered or suffer from com complete or partial loss of smell. So those statistics are still quite revealing. Now, the interesting thing is that until COVID, there had never been any serious attempt by researchers and health professionals in dealing with smell loss. It was trivialized. But as a result of it becoming one of the predominant symptoms, there's been, and that and that, now they've understood the consequences of what happens when one loses their sense of smell in terms of how it affects them psychologically, physiologically, sociologically, from a social perspective, a lot more research has been done into helping to identify what type of treatments work best and how to manage smell loss. So I hate to say, it doesn't sound like an, a pleasant thing to say, but perhaps the pandemic, one good thing out of the pandemic is it's allowed more researchers and um, health practitioners to research what can be done to deal with olfactory dysfunctions. Now, some more interesting facts that I found about COVID-related anosmia, and to tonight's presentation, I did want to um, focus more on COVID-related anosmia. One thing is that it is different to the olfactory dysfunction that we would associate with the common cold. Uh, most of us who have had a common cold or flu may for a short time experience that temporary loss of smell, but COVID-19 related anosmia is quite 
different, okay? Um, quite interestingly also, the taste functions are significantly worse with COVID-19 patients compared with the common cold. And those of you that have uh, you know, had experienced that olfactory dysfunction with the common cold, you'll notice how food often doesn't taste the same. But with COVID-19, individuals who have had COVID-19 and are experiencing anosmia, the taste is also severely impaired. Now, more interesting, and this helps you to perhaps understand that the pathology is different. Some people with COVID-19 related anosmia, even when you know, um, some people experience this COVID related anosmia, even when they could breathe freely. So their noses were not runny or congested, because this often is the reason why one would experience olfactory dysfunction. This dysfunction with the common cold. It's because of the nasal congestion. But with COVID related anosmia, even when our noses are not runny and congested, people could not um, smell. Now, this should be reassuring for most people. And please, if there are any of you that have, uh, who do not fit into these statistics, please um, share, share, share with us your experience. And I hope there's not too many of you at all. Um, but a 2021 study found that 28.2% of patients with COVID-related anosmia recovered within four months, while the remaining 41.2% 7%, 71.7%. Now, if you add that up, there's 0.1% missing. And I don't know that I didn't make a typo. So there's 0.1% that is not accounted for there, but 71.7% did so within 12 months. So I hope for those of you that have experienced COVID-related anosmia that you have recovered within this, within this time frame. Um, other studies, for example, have found that, um, for example, sense of smell often return within eight weeks from falling ill, but up to 90, another study suggested that 90% of people fully recovered their sense of smell after six months. So depending which paper study you read, you'll find that these statistics may, may vary slightly. I've tried to go with some of the more latter, latter, latter papers and latter, later studies. Now, I think it's important to just, um, and this is a little, a, a very short summary of some of the, the common definitions relating to olfactory disorders. Anosmia typically represents a total loss of smell. Now, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Agusia refers to a loss of the taste function of the tongue. We can then also experience specific anosmia. And this is where we are unable to detect a particular smell or smells. Hyposomnia is where we have a reduced olfactory function. And some have argued we all probably have, to a certain degree, hyposomnia, where we have a reduced olfactory function. Now, the next one is also quite con concerning. Um, well, the, I'll, I'll go through this. Dysomnia is there is a, ch a qualitative change of the sense of smell, whereas hyposomnia refers to the inability to smell odors to abnormal levels. This is quite rare. So uh, 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 odors are far more intense. This is often associated with those individuals who experience migraines. Parasomia, which seems to be also quite common with COVID-related anosmia, is there is a distorted sense of smell. That is, the smell is perceived as another smell and often a very unpleasant smell. Now, in I will be sending you in the email that you will receive, you will, you will have certain links um, to various articles uh, and some of them relate to some of 
these can, some of these can, some of these conditions. And then there is phantos phantosmia, which is where we perceive a smell that is not actually there. So there are some very, very interesting types of olfactory dysfunctions. So, and it's unlikely just to be purely anosmia. And you'll find that it can be a combination of several of these factors, even with COVID related olfactory dysfunctions. Now we need to look at some of the com more commonly um, reported cases of smell loss. And this, th these statistics are obviously before COVID. The highest is obviously post-viral upper respiratory tract infections. Up to 18 to 45% of the clinical population have experienced smell loss associated with respiratory tract infections. Seven to 56% related to nasal or sinus disease. Now we won't discuss each of these individually. Head traumas relates to eight to 20%. I've dealt a lot in my time as an acupuncturist with um, working with people with head traumas where they have lost their sense of smell. Exposure to toxins or drugs, anywhere from 2 to 65%, where it affects um, our sense of smell. And congenital loss, which I hope is not so common, it says 0 to 4%. So this is pretty much from birth. It can be anywhere from 0 to 4%. So these are some of the common causes of smell loss before COVID came along. Now, I do want to now spend some time looking at the pathophysiology of a COVID infection on olfaction. Now, I've summarized, and we're not going to go into each one of these into, uh, into great detail, but I've summarized some of the key um, some of the key factors that have been identified that could play a role in leading to smell loss. Number one is inflammatory damage. So in, there is inflammation in the tissue and this leads to smell loss. In some ways, this was definitely the case with normal upper respiratory tract infections. It definitely does play, play a role with COVID, but it's not as significant. Of course, inflammation is occurring, um, but it's not as significant. Number two, infection of the olfactory epithelium. This is definitely now understood to be the primary factor that leads to loss of smell. Now, there are knowing that is good and it's bad. And it's no clear black and white answer. And reading some of the research, I was a little bit um, confused, but also I didn't necessarily agree that things are so black and white. And I'll, we'll understand why the olfactory epithelium is involved very soon. Now, this then leads to the fact that what researchers have also found is that there is a relationship between anosmia and what they call long COVID or COVID-19 fatigue syndrome. There is also a risk. Now, you've got to remember that the olfactory neurons are actually considered part of the central nervous system. They are considered part of the brain. So there is a real concern as well about the COVID-19 virus and the impact that it can have and, and how it can, via the olfactory pathway, cause um, inflammation to areas of the brain, which may lead to some of the symptoms that have often been such as fatigue and emotional uh, and, and emotional distress that is seen in some patients who have had 
what we call long COVID. And then there is also the latest research, and this was a paper that was just very recently published, notice that those who suffered and those individuals that were more likely to experience olfactory loss, there was a genetic link. But I'm not too sure that I think that they understood why they just noticed that this was the case. Now, what we need to understand is that the COVID virus, the little spike proteins that you see on the virus, they bind with ACE2 and T TMPRSS2 receptors. Now, these receptors are highly expressed throughout the body, the gastrointestinal tract, in the nasal and bronchial epithelium, as well as in the lung tissues as well. Now, the olfactory neurons, interestingly, do not express the gene that encodes this ACE2 receptor protein, which the, which the COVID virus uses to enter the human cells. But it's, that it's via these ACE2 receptors that are found in the cells that prov um, now the these receptors are found in what we refer to as the supporting tissue the epithelium that supports the olfactory neurons so what we do know is that the infection is not covid virus is not damaging the olfactory neurons. It is infecting what is referred to as the non-neuronal support olfactory cells. And this then leads to anosmia. So therefore, what this is saying, because it's when there is permanent damage to those olfactory receptor neurons that we're not likely to regain our sense of smell. So what this seems to suggest that we should all those who are experiencing anosmia should eventually regain their sense of smell at some stage because the olfactory receptor neurons are not damaged. But the damage that can be done to the supporting tissue can affect the functioning of the olfactory receptor neurons. And that is what is of concern. Now, for, now, these images, by the way, they are, you can find them in my book, The Complete Guide to Aromatherapy, Volume 3. Um, I have a wonderful chapter on, a, uh, on the olfactory system. I really felt that it was important to include the olfactory system in Volume 3, in which I actually talk about the psyche and the su more subtle aspects of aromatherapy. Now, what you can see, those scylla that I'm talking about, um, these are basically part of what we refer to as the olfactory receptor neurons. Um, and then you can see the epithelial lining below that. That it, it is the epithelial lining that supports the olfactory neurons that get infected because they have the ACE2 receptors which get allowed the COVID, the COVID virus to infect the tissue of the nasal epithelium. Now this is zooming in on just one of those little hair-like structures, the olfactory cells, the olfactory receptor neurons. And so you can see the, the virus does not affect the neuron, but the tissue around supporting the olfactory receptors. Now these, the tissue supporting the olfactory neurons is very important because it nourishes these cells. They have a life cycle and a healthy functioning epithelium is needed. So it is likely when someone ha has COVID infection, it is likely that the, olf the regeneration capacity of the olfactory receptor neurons is temporarily impaired. So that's what we seem to understand. So this, this is a more schematic. So for example, it is not the olfactory nerve fibers, but it's the Bowman's glands, and it's through the um, other structures supporting the tissue in which 
the COVID virus penetrates and infects those cells. So you can see, of course, when there will be an infection, there is also likely to be levels of inflammation. So inflammation is also occurring within that nasal, nasal epithelium. And this is also, also very important. And some researchers have focused on the effects of this inflammation and how it affects the sense of smell and its relationship what, with what is referred to as long COVID. So of course, whenever there is the presence of viruses near these nerve cells, you are going to find an influx of activity within the immune system, um, influx of all the cell, all the immune cells that are responsible for fighting an infection. Of course, these cells will release cytokines. And it's very interesting because when there is a release of cytokines, it may actually change the genetic activity of the olfactory nerve cells. And hence that genetic link, whereas some genes are more susceptible to others. So even though the virus, the COVID virus, does not infect, infect the olfactory nerve cells, it can have an impact on the genetic activity of the olfactory neurons. Now, researchers believe that when there is any form of immune, cell, immune, yeah, immune activity, especially in the brain, um, it's, go, it's going to be very important. It's going to be very important to, for the body to deal with this very quickly. But one of the, the, the activity that's going on with the immune system signaling persists in a way that reduces the activity of the genes responsible for building olfactory receptors. And hence, this is why there probably has been a delay in regaining the sense of smell immediately if these genes have been affected. Now, it's been suggested that the ongoing immune cell reactions within the nasal cavity will, of course, influence our emotions. And of course, this is what leads to what they call some of the inability, the a bit inability with where we feel tired, we can't think clearly, which is obviously consistent with some of the symptoms associated with long COVID. So it is very complex in terms of there are multiple pathways involved. We know that they in the COVID virus infects the epith epithelium and not the olfactory receptor cells, but by infecting the epith epithelium, the supporting cells that support the olfactory receptor cells, neurons, it seems to affect their ability to regenerate or their ability for us to regain that sense of smell quickly. So, and this researchers have now really believe that anosmia could be a predictor for a, what we call a post-COVID-19 fatigue syndrome. So especially for those COVID patients where, who remain anosmic for longer periods of time, it's likely, it's likely that larger areas of the olfactory epithelium have been affected. It's possible that there was more destruction of this epithelium. And the destruction of this epithelium will indirectly lead to the death of a large number of olfactory neurons. Now, Ch Chap Watson was, is concerned because he's basically saying also that this the damage that could result to the olfactory epithelium and the olfactory sensory neurons can lead to a congestion of leakage of the glymphatic system, which in the brain, which is equivalent to the lymph system of the brain, which can lead to possible toxic buildup in, within the brain. And he, Watson believes that COVID-19 patients where there is persistent anosmia and persistent fatigue at month four, there is a connection with the two. Now, 
I've briefly touched on these factors, you know, some of the pathophysiology, very briefly, some of the pathophysiology associated with the COVID virus and the infection in the nasal epithelium. What I now want to look at, and there are some very interesting links. This is the first one. You'll be sent this link. It was in The Guardian. It was in The Guardian just last Friday. And I think the title of the paper, the, the title says it all. Impact of altered smell and taste. Experience after getting COVID. Everything I eat tastes like rotting flesh. Um, quite, quite quite distressing, I can imagine. So you'll be sent the link to this. Now, we do know now, and we have known for a long time, but it's very good that more researchers and more health practitioners are starting to pay attention to the effects of loss of taste and smell and how it affects our daily life and how it impacts um, one's psychological well-being, physical health and even the relationship. Now this is a very good paper, you'll find the reference to it in the blog, the blog that I've written and by the way the blog that I've written is an update and it's significantly updated from the original blog that I wrote back in November. But this is a very good article which um, the, the, the authors have spent a lot of time documenting how altered smell and taste, anosmia, parasomnia, have impacted individuals' well-being. So it's excellent, excellent paper. I'm going to summarize some of the key findings. Now, one of the first things you'll notice is that many individuals who experience loss of smell describe food as being very bland and unappetizing. And as a result, this has a major impact on appetite, our ability to enjoy food and an ability to know when we're feeling full and satisfied with our meal. This, of course, then impacts on our social bonding, dining out with friends and other people, which is often an important daily pleasure of helping to form social bonds. It's, enjoyed, it's impaired because that impaired sense of smell and taste means that we don't find this experience enjoyable any longer. Now this is, and I felt the best way to share some of the findings of what it means to lose a sense of smell. And I probably don't need to remind some of you that are experiencing it now. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if you've related to any of these comments. The world is very blank, or if not blank, it's shades of decay. It's almost like this sense of decay where you have a distorted sense of smell is very common. I feel alien from myself. It's also kind of, kind of a loneliness in the world. It's like part of me is missing as I can no longer smell and experience. So it's very interesting that people, of course, we relate to smell is often there's that very strong emotional connection. As I no longer smell and I can, and experience the emotions of everyday basic living. So there's a sense of being detached from normality, lonely in my body. It's so hard to explain. So this is one of the comments from somebody who participated in this a survey in terms of how they felt. This would be very tragic for me. Wine smells like sewerage. Prosecco is even worse. Poo now smells better than coffee. So it really leads to an altered state of um, your taste is totally altered in terms of um, a, um, this loss of um, this smell dysfunction that you experience with the COVID infection. Now, at a more social level, this is, this is, of course, very interesting because we form bonds and connection with other people. There have been a whole lot of research done in this area. And this individual says, I can't smell my boyfriend's natural body odors anymore, which makes me feel distant from him. He's like a stranger. I used to feel comforted by being able to smell him while cuddling. 
Worse is that his kiss tastes bad to me now, so I avoid it. But I haven't told him because I don't want to hurt his feelings. Also, I am constantly worried that I smell bad myself and it makes me feel very secure. So some very distressing feedback, um, experience, some very distressing experiencing, experiences from those who have experienced smell dysfunctions and anosmia. So in conclusion, I just thought for this section, I just wanted to highlight one final comment, which I really think shows what profound impact not being able to smell has on our mental and emotional well-being. I'm losing hope. I've never been more depressed in my life. Will I ever get better? This has left me so low in mood. It's really quite debilitating physically, mentally, and professionally. I'm six months in and losing hope. So for those of you that are still experiencing olfactory dysfunction, please don't give up. Don't lose hope yet. Please. The statistics are on your side, I hope. Thank you. Now, almost all the papers that I was reading that were talking about anosmia and smell dysfunction referred to smell training. And it's very interesting because the smell training also involves the use of essential oils. Now, this is another link and it's from the BBC. I really, it's only like, it goes for less than two minutes. It's really worth checking out as well because Hamel is a, he is a, he's a German researcher, ear, throat, nose specialist who actually has been involved in the smell training. Um, and he talks about how effective it can be in most cases. So check out this link, you'll be sent the link to this in the email that you will be receiving. Now, there was an, there was an original study I found because most of the papers and most of the blogs seem to repeat the same oils that one should use. So I wanted to dig a bit deeper into this and it all relates to this original study. And here they use four odorants. Now, by the way, they use phenyl ethyl alcohol, which has a rose odor. They use 1,8-cineol, which is found in essential oils like rosemary and eucalyptus. And they used a lemon odor, a citral, um, a citral compound perhaps. And they used eugenol, which is found in clove bud. So four odorants was used. And since this study, the, you know, the rose, you'll often see rose, eucalyptus, lemon, and clove bud being recommended. And But what I wanted to do, my research found out, well, you know what? You can probably choose any four cents, four cents, but as long as they're from different smell categories, and this seems to be confirmed by other researchers. Rimmer, for example, says, choose scents from four smell categories, and he suggests a flowery scent, a fruity scent, a spicy scent, and a resinous aroma. I looked at this and I thought, hmm, resinous, and when I read the paper, they were actually referring to the scent of the eucalyptus, the 1,8 cineol, so perhaps a more medicinal camphoraceous aroma would have been more suitable. So it would appear, others seem to, you know, it seems to be, and this seems to be a general consensus, as long as you choose four scents, now I don't know why four scents, but four scents, but of different odor categories that, that should work. And so so I was reading also saying you should choose any smell you feel comfortable with and that you would normally have enjoyed. OK, so choose some of your favorite oils, but they can't all be like if you like lavender and ylang, ylang and rose. You can only choose one floral. You can only choose one fruity like a lemon or a lemongrass, maybe a spicy scent. You could choose cinnamon or clove. And then, of course, many oils rich in 1,8 cineol or camphor. So, uh, so it could be rosemary, it could be eucalyptus or tea tree, any essential oil. Now, before we finish this section, there is another very interesting paper that was very, just published, which I will share with you as well. Now, how is this olfactory training meant to be done? First of all, it should be done twice a day for at least three months, morning and 
afternoon and you sniff each essential oil for 20 seconds. Now you could sniff it straight out of the bottle, you could sniff it, you could use one of these little nasal um, um, nasal inhalers, you could just have a little jar with a bit of cotton wool and just put a few drops of oil and smell that. If you're doing this, just top it up or just you know refresh it with new essential oil every couple of days. But it seems to be 20 seconds twice a day for each of the four scents that you have chosen. Now this it seems to be the preferred treatment, not just for anosmia associated with COVID, but for many other um, um, forms of olfactory dysfunction and anosmia as well. Now, I just found this. This was um, a very, very recent paper, and even now the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons is promoting smell training as therapy for COVID-related anosmia. And the recent blog published here by Peter Friedland says that any four different odors can be used. It doesn't appear to decrease the efficacy of the therapy. But the only advice that I would give you is that you choose four different types of odors. Now, the statistics seem to show that this should work eventually. So don't give up on this treatment. Be diligent. Now, this is while the true exact mechanism is not fully understood. Um, it appears that repeated exposure to the odorant may somehow affect the regenerative capacity of the olfactory mucosa. It helps with the healing of the olfactory mucosa. And the aim of smell training could also help to recover um, um, that neuroplasticity, allowing the brain to reorganize itself to compensate for any change or injury that has occurred to any of that olfactory epithelium, which has also related in loss of olfactory receptor neurons. So it seems to have a regenerative capacity and also it seems to be able to influence neuroplasticity. So you have to be diligent with the smell training, please. Let me know, those of you that have partaken um, in smell training, let me know the effects that it has had. Now, this paper only just recently came out. I've actually come across several papers by Koi, Koyama. Uh, and in here, this paper was exciting because these um, many, many people were involved in the um, writing of this paper. And it got me so excited. Koyama was interested in exploring the role of the essential oils in smell training and asked why, whether the essential oils used in smell training also have a pharmacological basis. So this is where I really get excited because now we are seeing some academics and scientists and researchers going, hey, we should be paying attention to the pharmacological activity of the essential oils as well. So could there be another role that the essential oils that we use in smell training are playing? Koyama believes that there are. First of all, I totally supported Koyama's who says that he was so surprised that the lack of acknowledgement of the bioactive properties of the essential oils that are often used within the smell training. And they are actually, they, they made some statements that were critical by some clinicians who would claim that the bioactivity of the chemical constituents in essential oils is completely unsupported by any science because Koyama and, and the authors involved in this paper provide us with extensive 
research show, um, explaining the bioactivity of the chemical constituents found in many of the essential oils. And they believe that perhaps we should, that, um, and they provide us with the scientific evidence which suggests that perhaps we should choose the essential oils and smell training based on the bioactive properties. So this is some of the pharmacological activities that we can expect from the essential oils. So what are they? So for example, they're talking about the essential oils, anti-inflammatory properties, antimicrobial properties, antiviral properties, ability to enhance cell proliferation or enhancing cell migration, which is very important where you have this nasal epithelium that has been damaged. And so they believe that when we, the essential oils that are used in smell training may actually support the process of regeneration of the damaged neuroepithelial tissue. Now I talk about this a lot more in the blog that you will be able to read, which comes with this presentation that I am doing. Very exciting. And at least some researchers are saying, hey, well, what is the basis for the smell training? They're suggesting that perhaps it has something to do with the bioactivity of some of the essential oil constituents. Now, very briefly, I wanted to highlight some of the other therapies, and I've put a lot more details of this um, or some of the other strategies, they're not necessarily therapies, um, that, one, that one should consider. Now, I found one very, very interesting one from the University of Cincinnati. And the texture of food, it probably is more of a coping mechanism. So what it says, where we have lost our sense of taste or where the taste um, is quite distorted, Get people, make sure you eat a variety of food with different textures. While you may not be able to taste them, while you cannot smell them, like notice the crunchiness of an apple, the softness of a strawberry, or the different texture of a mango or so on. Look at foods and temperature, look at the temperature, cold drinks, carbonated drinks, different foods that will provide a different sensation and different texture as we are chewing or drinking them. Now, there is a lot of research that also suggests that zinc plays an important role. And some of you may have had some experience with zinc in regaining the sense of smell. Um, vitamin A also seems to have been recommended. Alpha lipoic acid, however, for alpha lipoic acid, it seems that they, um, the, um, some medical practitioners say that this should not be used for more than two weeks. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids have also been recommended. And while there are some that are critical, and this is health medical practitioner state that in some cases, corticosteroids seem to work in cases of inflammatory um, where there is inflammation. However, it appears that the jury is out on the effectiveness in, co in um, anosmia. So in some cases, some studies have found it to be effective and in other cases, it was not found to be effective. Um, I hope I have been able to give you a little bit of an insight into smell dysfunctions and anosmia associated with COVID. Please, if you are experiencing anosmia, please continue on with the, strat, you know, the strategy that you have been using. If you haven't tried smell training, but I'm sure you would have done your research and you would have been trying um, using smell tra training, please persist with it. Now, before I do finish, so any questions that you have, please post them on social media and I will get back to you and I will share them. I will share I'll do my best to answer them and I'll share them the answer with everybody. But if it's rather per personal question that you have, I will just make sure I respond to you. But please, thank you so much for your attention. And I hope that the information that I've presented in this evening's presentation and also in the actual blog, in the, the notes that you will receive will be of help. 
Now, just to finish off, the next online seminar webinar that I'll be doing, slightly different. In, during the time of a pandemic, the bubonic plague back in the, the 14th century, um, where I will look at the wisdom of Julian of Norwich and, and my relationship of a lot of her work with aromatherapy and how it can be of use of Julian of Norwich, it should say there. And that will be on Wednesday, the 2nd of March, 2022. Now, all these events, depending on where you are around the world, we will be posting a link so you'll be able to watch them at a time that's more reasonable for 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 you to watch. Um, because I'm so grateful and thankful that the people from all, uh, all, all so many countries around the world that have been watching um, uh, um, have have um, enrolled in tonight's webinar. Now, just remember, if you haven't got any of these books, these books will be of um, these books are av available. Please check them out. Um, I am still working. I just read a. A question, somebody asked a question, when is volume two coming out? It will be coming out soon. When I say soon, not 2022, but certainly hopefully 2023. Um, so these are some of the books that I have written. Take advantage of that 10% discount that we're offering. And there is also a special deal on free shipping. Thank you so much. Please take care. And I look forward to um, hear, um, hearing your feedback uh, and any questions that you have. Please take care. Thank you.